I have another video which is a book review of the Constitution of Knowledge. And that book review makes this seem like the best thing since sliced bread, which I pretty much think it is. But I always end my book reviews with some sort of critique. So this video is actually me critiquing the book. You really should watch that other video before you watch this video because that other video lays out his ideas that are like a lifetime's worth of ideas and I'm not trying to tear them down in this video. I'm just going to add on to them and point to the parts of the story that I think we're missing from this book. And of course, this relates to what I'm doing on this channel because on the channel I'm thinking about social media, tech monopolies, institutional decline, and what we can do to fix some of the information distortion problems that we're seeing on social media. This book is the essential reading for understanding how do we understand reality when reality is being constantly manipulated and distorted. So where I'm going with this, I have four critiques and they fall under the categories of salience, contempt, power seeking, and examples probably not aging well. My first critique slash addition to his book is that I think the salience frame matters a lot. So if we're going to talk about the reality-based community, reality is not sufficient. There also have to be values that sort of place each piece of reality into, into its proper size. And this gets at the idea that when we seek information, it's not just to uncover reality, it's also generally because that information has some use and could actually affect what we do, how we, how we help people, it could affect political reality. And so every person, as they encounter new pieces of information, new facts, new understandings of how things work, they're going to be also at the same time figuring out how should society be structured? What kinds of problems should we pay a lot of attention to? What kinds of problems are not a big deal? How do we weigh problems against each other in their salience, their importance? And that's inherently a value judgment. So what I call the salience frame is really the frame of how you place reality into a worldview that is right-sized. And we as a community have to collectively determine right size. And one of my critiques here of what he's saying is that he's kind of looking at reality a little bit apart from this salience lens, as if uncovering facts is sort of the bottom line thing we need to be doing. And I think a lot of the battles that are happening, which are political battles over reality and over information, a lot of these are not battles about the facts or the actual reality. They're battles about how big each problem should be in the eyes of the decision makers of the world. So a lot of what we're seeing is people using true facts to distort the worldview in the sense of making small facts that should be small into really big things that would drive policy decision making. That's a lot of the distortion we have going on with reality. And in this book, I don't think he fully acknowledges that, or he doesn't wrestle with it in a way that feels fully sufficient. And of course, because that's mixing reality with with values, which inherently has to happen. Those two things are hard to separate. They're almost like scrambled eggs. The egg and the yolk are kind of mixed together to the point where you can't really separate them. I think the tricky part of dealing with the constitution of knowledge might come not in the way we seek out facts and seek out theories. It's, it's in the way we place those into a proper community-held worldview. Now my second critique here has to do with contempt. And this one is similar to the first in the sense that I think it's more about the way information distortion is happening, especially in online conversations. But of course, online conversations jump into policymaker conversations and academic conversations because everybody is online, including those people in those positions of power. My definition of contempt is that it's an attitude of disgust arising from long-standing negative thoughts 
about a group or person being morally inferior, intellectually inferior, or beneath consideration. And I think a lot of the reactivity that we see online when we exchange facts and when we exchange theories and realities and, tr and truth, not, not real truth, but online truth, is not so much reactivity about the facts themselves or the information themselves or the reality. It's, it's reactivity about what groups get contempt based on certain facts. So this is actually pretty related to salience. I think a lot of the fights about reality are really not about reality in and of itself. They're not about the facts. They're not about the theories. They're about what groups of people get contempt from the decision makers in society. And how this happens is if you look at any group of people, they're going to have strengths and weaknesses on average. And if you have all academics, all people in the knowledge-based community who are only focused on the negative of a certain group and never on the positive. And if those academics have power in any way, then what might happen is the way the knowledge gets translated into policy and into people's real lives could be done in a way that takes away the rights of that group that's always considered a problem and never considered people of inherent worth and value to be protected with human rights and other rights of societal participation. And to be clear, I think this contempt is coming from both sides of the aisle. And so you can imagine people could be absolutely pursuing reality, but they're only pursuing the part of reality that is bad about certain groups and only pursuing the part of reality that is good about other groups. And that is going to lead to an inherently unjust society. And my sense is that a lot of the battles we're having over information and over reality really have more to do with contempt underneath the surface. So I think we're not going to get a good constitution of knowledge unless we acknowledge that that is what's going on and that there needs to be some way of figuring out how to protect groups of people from only being seen with contempt by those in the reality-based community. I think that needs to be a part of the constitution of knowledge if we want that knowledge to translate into justice. The third piece of the story that I think he's missing is that communities of knowledge can be hijacked or captured by other powers. And in particular, they can be hijacked by economic powers or political powers or both. And when Jonathan Rout highlights these two forces that are degrading the information environment, one of which is cancel culture and the other of which is troll culture that sort of pollutes the information environment with false information with other designs, I think either of those could possibly be connected to other forces that are acting inside the system. But those are not the only two ways that power and money can come in and have an influence. I think there's social engineering, there's norm setting, there's charismatic people who come in with their agenda. There are so many different ways that the community of knowledge can be captured by these other forces. So if we're going to set up a constitution of knowledge, it's not just that we need checks and balances, we need some checks and balances that are explicitly designed to uh, hold up the spotlight where money and power can have influence. We, we need some ways of sort of separating um, money and power from the constitution of knowledge. And I think we're going to need multiple ways of protecting the community of knowledge from those forces, ways of identifying where is there a back door that money and power can come in, how are money and power influencing social settings, influencing culture, and those are really big, deep questions. But if we want a functional constitution of knowledge, we need to be talking about that directly and developing checks and balances that address that problem directly. And then the last critique I have is I think some of his specific examples are going to not age well. 
And honestly, I don't know which of those are not going to age well. I mean, I could make my own guesses, but I won't. But I think one of the problems we have right now is everybody, including Jonathan Rauch, including myself, including policymakers and academics and everybody, is looking at information through the lens of social media, which combines information consumption with emotional hijack. With, with emotions and identities and things that will get us riled up. And so because our only source of information right now is wedded to these other highly manipulative forces that have their own designs, such as keeping us on platform and selling us things through advertisements, because that's the information sphere, any examples we see through that lens are going to have some distortions built in. So my guess is any author who uses real examples that come from the social media sphere of the 2020s is going to have examples in their book that look weird and look ignorant and look um, out of touch when viewed from a lens of 50 years from now where we have more distance from, from those things. This is actually the reason on this channel that I do my best not to use specific examples that are floating around the internet because I don't think a lot of those will age well. And I also think sometimes people will sort of get sucked into the right or the left or the anti-establishment or the, the pro-institution. They'll get sucked into these different communities and they'll see the problem with the other side, but they won't be able to see the same exact phenomenon on their own side. So I try to avoid specific examples as much as possible. I try to come up with hypothetical examples. I think Jonathan Rauch would have actually done better to use hypothetical examples, but it's hard to come up with good ones. So that's really just a minor critique of the book. And in some ways, I have no real critiques of the book. I really just think the book doesn't look at a few things that it really should if it wants a complete constitution of knowledge.